Hello, I'm Daniel O'Connor, and I just want to give you a very quick introduction to the most amazing mystic and private revelation that you've ever heard of. Of the thousands of private revelations given over the 2,000 year history of the church, only one has been given the express mission by Jesus of ushering in the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer, so that the will of God would be done on earth as it is done in heaven. That is the private revelation I'm about to tell you about. Uh, the mystic's name is the servant of God, Luisa Vigaretta. Now, that's what we know her as right now, as I'm recording this video in early 2020. For all I know, when you're watching it, she'll be known as Blessed or even Saint Luisa Vigaretta. We'll see. Anyway, what that tells us, of course, right off the bat, is this is an approved mystic with approved private revelations. You can rest assured of that. We'll get to those details later, though. She received thousands of pages of revelations from Jesus, primarily on the gift of living in the divine will. We'll talk about that in a moment, as well as the imminent reign of the divine will on earth. Louisa died in 1947. She lived almost her entire 81-year-long life bedridden, knitting altar cloths. She's from a little town named Corato in Italy. From the outside, it seems that she lived maybe the most boring life in history. So as usual, when it comes to the works of God, we have to peek beneath the surface to see what's really going on here. As soon as you lift this veil of the surface of what her life looked like externally, even a little bit, you'll be utterly blown away. Um, let's see what Jesus told her over the course of these decades. Here's a binder. Um, this is one of over a dozen I have. That's thousands and thousands of pages of revelations. Now that might take you a while to get through. So instead of going through all that right now, let me just give you the gist of it in a few minutes here. Uh, the great thing about these revelations, the, the, despite the thousands of pages that they encompass, is that the most important thing about them is the gift that they reveal this gift of living in the divine will. And that, you could say, is the gist of these revelations. And as soon as you know the gist of these revelations, you already have, ma you already have well, succeeded you know, in, in a real way. You've succeeded. Now, I, uh, I have a master's in theology from a Catholic seminary. I'm a college professor of philosophy and religion. I'm a doctoral student working on my PhD in philosophy, and I've been studying these revelations for almost a decade. And guess what? Despite all that, forget about all that. Because you, whoever you are, as long as you just pay attention for a few minutes, you can easily surpass me in this gift. And that's all that matters, is this gift. Receiving this gift through the knowledge of it from these revelations. This is received much better by the simple than by the scholars. So please listen closely. After 2,000 years of arduous preparation, the church is finally ready to receive her crown. We're living in the most exciting time in the history of the world. Not because the end of the world is at hand, but because the crown of history is at hand. The purpose of the world, the purpose of history is at hand. It's what Pope St. John Paul II taught when he said that we pray for the kingdom to come with its peace and justice to reestablish the original harmony of creation. It's what God himself, it's what he said that, it's what John Paul II said that God himself wishes to endow Christians with at the dawn of the third millennium, a new and divine holiness to make Christ the heart of the world. It's what Pope St. Pius X taught with his very papal motto in his first and most important encyclical, A Supremia, the restoration of all things in Christ, where he prophesied magisterially that all things, not some things, all things would be restored in Christ. It's what his successor, Pius XI, taught when he proclaimed the feast of Christ the King, saying that we will see that peace which the, which the King of Peace came to bring on earth. It's what even Pope Francis said when he taught the kingdom of God is already here in some aspects. But it is not fully here. We are still waiting for a more full coming of the kingdom in the future, which we pray for and long for and work for. It's also what Pope Francis taught when he said that we are waiting for the realization of the world as God wills it. In other words, that's not just something that will be realized in heaven. No, history itself is working towards, proceeding towards the realization 
of the world as God wills it. It's what almost all the fathers of the church taught when they insisted upon a glorious era during the third millennium after Christ. It's what the unanimous consensus of trustworthy private revelation says. I can't even begin to go through all of the other ones, but there is a unanimous consensus that this glorious reign of God, this era of peace, this reign of the divine will, this Eucharistic reign is coming. So I hate to break it to those of you who are dead set on uh, doom and gloom, but there's no escaping it. God's ultimate plan for the world is now about to be fulfilled. The very thing that billions of Christians throughout the world for thousands of years have been praying more fervently and repeatedly than anything else. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That petition is about to be answered. The will of God is going to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. There's all sorts of names for this. I've already mentioned a couple. The triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The second Pentecost. The coming of Christ in grace. Not the final coming in physically at the end of time. The reign of the divine will on earth. The Eucharistic reign of Jesus. But I, I tend to keep it simple. Those are all very good names. I tend to just call it the era of peace. That's what it certainly will be. It's not millenarianism. Certainly not. It's not modified millenarianism. According to the church's magisterium, which of course is what matters here, both of those heresies, millenarianism and modified millenarianism, they both consist in the notion that Jesus is going to physically come to reign on earth. But no, not until heaven do we get the physical, literal presence of Jesus unveiled in the beatific vision. We'll, we'll still die during the era. We'll still need faith. We can still suffer. Sin is still ontologically possible. Uh, perhaps most importantly, we will still have the church with all of her sacraments, her hierarchies, her doctrines, no passing away of the age of the church. But Jesus will reign. He will reign like never before in history. He will reign through his Eucharistic presence. He will, his will shall be done on earth, just as the saints do it in heaven. That's what he prayed for. That's what he prophesied. And that's what he promised. And the only prayer he taught us to pray, the Our Father prayer, is going to be fulfilled. And maybe you haven't thought too much about this yet, but think about it now. Did you really think the greatest petition of the greatest prayer would go unanswered? Did you think that God would just let the world limp on in its present agony for many more decades or even centuries until at long last, at the end of time, Jesus comes physically to put the world out of its misery and, and it, it commence the, uh, the last judgment? Did you really think that history would end without God winning first? No, of course not. He's going to make sure that his own divine prayer is answered. No prayer uttered by the lips of the Son of God can possibly go unanswered. Certainly not his greatest prayer. Certainly not the only one he specifically commanded and taught us to pray. Now, let's get to more details on this. The saints in heaven, so we're, he's, he's prophesying and, and, and praying and commanding us to pray that the will of God be done on earth as it is done in heaven. How do the saints do the will of God in heaven? Well, they don't just submit to his commands. They don't just figure out his will and then try to do it uh, independently of uh, his will itself. No, of course not. The will of a saint in heaven is God's will. They're identical. Of course, the saint's own will is not annihilated. This is not some sort of Eastern notion of annihilation of the self. Certainly not. This, the saint's own will exists even with much more flourishing than it ever would have if this saint didn't live in the divine will. Rather, it's merely that the saint's will has as its own principle the will of God. Just like your body has as its own principle your soul. When the, when the soul leaves the body, the body's dead. It's still there, still a hunk of matter, but it's a heck of a lot less of an important hunk of matter than it was when the soul animated it. Same thing with this gift of living in the divine will. That's how the saints do the will of God in heaven. They live in it. God's will is their will. This does not annihilate them. It does not annihilate their personalities. They exist just as much as they ever did, even more so. Same with us now on earth. Now that the time has come for this gift to be freely given to those on earth who want it. This type of life, this complete union with God in the highest possible degree is called living in the divine will. All the previous sanctities of the church have perfectly and beautifully, step by step, 
led us up to this precise moment in which we now live in church history. The divinization taught by the church fathers, leading to the mystical marriage taught by some of the greatest doctors of the church, led to the spirituality of the unification of wills taught especially by the great uh, spiritual masters in the French school. Think of uh, St. Francis de Sales, St. Alphonsus Liguori, uh, leading up to eventually St. Therese of Lisieux above all. And then Marian consecration, the catalyst for the explosion of this gift of living in the divine will throughout the whole world. All of these sanctities, if you actually trace out their growth, you can see that they lead perfectly and beautifully towards their crown, which is the gift of living in the divine will, which is the crown of sanctity, which is what Jesus calls it to Louisa. So why now? Why has this sanctity been reserved for our age? Well, as we know, God saves the best wine for last, and where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Put more philosophically, as Aquinas says, although the first, uh, sorry, the first in intention is the last in execution. It's fairly straightforward, actually. Whatever you intend to eventually bring about when you begin a work is the thing that you see last. The very fact that you're still working means that you haven't yet arrived at the thing you're ultimately working towards. Well, history is not some arbitrary process left up, left up to chance. Who's the architect of history? The rich people of the world? The, 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 the devil? Of course not. The Holy Spirit is the architect of history, and all sorts of things that God doesn't specifically will happen within history. But that does not change the fact that he's the master over all of it, and he is working through it. Sometimes very subtly, sometimes it's not easy to see, but he's always at work. And the fact that he is at work means that we are still working towards his ultimate plan for history, which has now been revealed to us in clarity through this mystic I'm telling you about. The great thing about it, the great thing about this gift of living in the divine will that, that, uh, that I'm telling you about, like all graces, it is, it is grace. Yes, it is, it is the grace of graces, but it's still grace. And what does that tell us above all? That it's free. And it's easy. It's a, it's a gift. Be a good Catholic. Keep doing everything you're doing in your current Catholic spiritual moral regimen. Above all the sacraments, of course. This doesn't dispense from any of that. This doesn't replace any of that. Don't believe anyone who says it does. This is the crown. The crown does not remove anything that was already there. Keep doing all of the things you are doing to strive after sanctity as a good Catholic. Now, on top of that, you simply need to know of this gift. Want this gift. Ask for this gift. Give God your will so that he can give you his will. Please, right now. Just repeat, Jesus, I trust in you. Thy will be done. I give you my will. Please give me yours in return. Jesus, I trust in you. Thy will be done. I give you my will. Please give me yours in return. It wasn't too hard, was it? There's a lot more to it than that. We've got the thousands of pages of revelations here, but that's the gist. And if you sincerely desire this gift, if you sincerely desire union with God in the highest possible degree, if you're in a state of grace, if you desire it and ask for it, and fully give him your will, all of it, not, not, not keeping any of it for yourself, but if you hand your will entirely to God, he will give you his. It's that simple. So although, as I said, I've got all these stupid letters, you know, the academic letters and more that I'm working on, and I've spent all this time studying these, these materials, you, you now, right now, as I say, as you hear these words, you very well might be uh, far beyond me in this gift, just by asking for that sincerely. In fact, you probably are, because I'm a complete knucklehead. Uh, maybe that's why God has asked me to, to promote this, because I'm such a knucklehead, and if I can be into this, anyone can. So... You ask that, and the gift is yours. Why, more specifically, should you want it? Because anything you could ever legitimately want is already within this gift. Everything, all of your legitimate desires, as a soul striving after sanctity, they're all within this gift. An invincible anchor of your salvation, deliverance from purgatory, perfect, uninterrupted peace, joy, and happiness. The power to evangelize like never before. The power to proclaim the divine mercy like never before. The purpose of the times we're living in now, 
is to have as many individuals as possible receive this gift of sanctity in order, to pre in order to prepare the ground for the universal reign of this sanctity. That is, when the kingdom of God comes fully on earth in the imminent, glorious era of universal peace. This era is coming. Nothing can stop it. No one can stop it. But it's coming like a freight train, and you do not want to be on the wrong side of its arrival. It's coming by way of chastisements, the likes of which the world has ever seen, which in turn will be preceded by a warning to give, our, to give the world a chance to repent. This isn't some utopian Marxist daydream. This isn't about being a social justice warrior and a liberation theologian and pretending you can build the kingdom of God on earth step by step with your own efforts. This isn't about us all getting lobotomized and holding hands and singing kumbaya and pretending that means something. No, this is about an imminent explosion of God's grace. An explosion of God's grace like the world has never seen before. And you know how that's going to feel for those not in a state of grace? Not good. It's going to hurt a lot. Now to be ready for what's coming. Above all, as I said, be in a state of grace, but especially to be truly ready, to be ready to reap the great harvest of souls that the coming events will especially enable. You need this gift. You need to live in the divine will. Spare no expense in striving after it. Now, it seems like we're extremely close to these events beginning. Jesus didn't tell Louisa exactly when this would happen. He's not going to set dates. Why? Well, uh, because so much depends upon our response. So much depends upon how we respond to these invitations. Uh, he did, however, give us a general idea. He said he renews the world every 2,000 years. After, you know, 2,000 years after uh, the fall of man with the flood, 2,000 years after the flood with his redemption. And where are we now? We're almost at 2,000 years after the redemption. Again, this is not about dates. The point is just to say that we are close and we need to stop wasting time, stop procrastinating, stop being lazy and stop pretending that we have no obligation in this. Of course we do. I'm not saying it's, it's the deposit of faith. It's a faith. It's not public revelation. It's, it doesn't require your supernatural assent. So what? That doesn't mean you don't have an obligation in the matter. You do. You need to respond to this call. Now, there's, um, th there's the most glorious private revelation in the history of the church in a nutshell. Uh, the nutshell is not enough. I mean, it's, it's, it's enough for you to receive the gift if you sincerely desire it and ask for it. Yes, and that's what's important. But it's not enough, period. It's not in vain that Jesus gave Louisa thousands of pages of Revelation. So please learn more. Please look into this. Uh, I've got a couple of books that I wrote on this. Here is the crown of history. And here's the crown of sanctity. As you can see, they are uh, of quite different sizes. I recommend that you read The Crown of History. It's tiny. It's only 108 pages. There's a... I do not want to make any money off this. I just want to promote these knowledges. You can go to YouTube and you can see the free... You can listen to the audiobook of this for free. Whole thing. You can go to my website, dsdoconnor.com and you can get the whole Crown of Sanctity as a free PDF. And that will give you another introduction, a little bit of a deeper introduction to this. Now, although I do not specifically mention Louisa in the title of either, I do mention her in the subtitle of this one, rest assured that both of these books are primarily about Louisa's revelations. The Crown of History, The Crown of Sanctity. Just look them up, it'll be very easy to find either. So, that's one thing you could do. Also, be sure, of course, to read the writings themselves. Now, at this point, I can only see two possibilities. Either you are on fire, to learn more about this gift and to receive this gift yourself, or you are doubting. I, I can't see any other possibility, because if, if you were awake for what I just said, you're crazy if you're not fired to receive this gift or doubting. So let's, uh, let's, let's address the doubt. Let's address that. Because unfortunately, there's all sorts of outdated, discredited, uh, honestly, slander posted online against Louisa's revelations, against Louisa herself, and against the revelations that Jesus gave to her. Most of it is from last millennium. Some of it is written by some pretty big Catholic names. Uh, these big Catholic names, I'll, I'll leave unnamed here, they were completely refuted so many times since these slanders were written. 
Uh, they were refuted by Luisa's archdiocese in 2005, when the archdiocese declared Luisa's heroic virtue and sent her cause as servant of God to the Vatican. So no, it's no procedural step that she's a servant of God. She's already had the ecclesiastical seal of holiness and orthodoxy from her diocese, and her cause is already in the Vatican. It's not like she was just declared a servant of God as a, some sort of procedural step, as if that ever happens anyway. It doesn't. But even if it did, that would have been decades ago. She's way past that. Uh, the, these, these critics were completely refuted by Pope St. John Paul II when he canonized St. Hannibal in 2004. St. Hannibal. Guess who he was? The most zealous promoter of Luis's revelations. Pope John Paul II chose to canonize. Uh, they were completely refuted in 2010 when the Vatican's own theological censors declared Luis's writings to be orthodox, completely free of any contradiction with Catholic faith and morals. They were completely refuted in 2011 when Bishop Luigi Negri approved the Benedictines of the Divine Will, a religious order explicitly dedicated to Luis's revelations. They were completely refuted in 2012 by Archbishop Picchietti when he issued a formal rebuke of those who claim that Luis's writings contain errors. Again in 2012, when the, fa when the faculty of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome unanimously approved Father Joseph Iannuzzi's doctoral thesis uh, explaining and defending her revelations. Again in 2013, by the theologian Stephen Patton's book, which bears an imprimatur explaining and defending Luis's revelations. Again in 2014, by the, by the great theologian, Father Edward O'Connor, no relation, uh, when he published his only, he was a great promoter of private revelations. The only book he ever wrote specifically on one mystic was on the Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, and her revelations. The last book he wrote before he died, strongly endorsing them. Above all, they were com these critics were completely refuted in 2015, when the Vatican itself published the official biography of the Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. This is the Vatican, strongly endorsing Luisa and her revelations. Not just that, this biography bears a preface from Cardinal Martins, who was the prefect for, the, for the, uh, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints under Pope St. John Paul II and uh, Pope Benedict XVI. He strongly endorses Louisa and her revelations in his preface to this book published by the Vatican. Uh, there's no more doubt anymore. There is not a single mystic or private revelation in the history of the church that has seen anywhere near this degree of approval, this degree of, of endorsements, this degree of verifications of authenticity, and later proven to be a fraud or an agent of Satan. Because guess what? Those are the only alternatives. There's no convenient, lukewarm, mediocre uh, third option where we can say, oh, yeah, Louisa was great and all, she was holy, but th this gift of living in the divine will and this reign of living in uh, of the divine will over the whole earth, that's just not true. She was just mistaken on that. That's just her imagination. Uh, that's not a reasonable or even possible alternative. The gift of living in the divine will and the imminent reign of the divine will on earth are teachings repeated thousands of times over the course of decades, under the most careful direction of the church, of theologians and priests appointed over her the whole time, they are the very purpose of her thousands of pages of revelations. They are the very purpose of her decades of mystical experiences. If they are not true, if the gift of living in the divine will and its imminent reign over the earth, if those are not true, then Louisa is a fraud or an agent of Satan. There is no other alternative. And neither of, those, neither of those options are even remotely tenable. It's also worth pointing out that her uh, revelations are full of fulfilled prophecies. Now, most of what her revelations prophesy regard what's coming, the, the reign of the divine will on earth. But many of her revelations, they were given throughout the 20th century, uh, prophesied events that have already occurred with stunning accuracy. It is, uh, there is no explanation for these prophecies other than that they were indeed sent from heaven. She was blatantly told by Jesus about World War II during World War I. She was told about the abuse crisis in the church. She was told with incredible accuracy the coming of, of certain earthquakes and volcanoes. She was told about, Jesus told her that Mussolini's march on Rome would gamble away Rome days before it occurred. No one knew that Rome would be gambled away. She was an uneducated, bedridden laywoman 
There is no way she could have predicted the things that her revelations predict with incredible and astonishing accuracy. In fact, I dare say that you will not find a single private revelation in history with as many fulfilled prophecies as Louisa's have. So at this point, I, I don't want to go on anymore because my point was to try to make this a short video. I'm just going to say now, at this point, uh, if you have a functioning brain and a mind that hasn't been poisoned by relativism, you realize something. You realize that we're stuck. We're stuck. We're stuck acknowledging that the kingdom of God is about to come more fully on earth than ever before. We are stuck acknowledging that God now wishes to give us the crown of all sanctity. We are stuck having to acknowledge that the greatest holiness is now being offered to anyone freely. And if that doesn't excite you and make you want to be a part of hastening this reign and make you want to receive this gift, then you might need a mental evaluation or an exorcism. And since both of those things are above my pay grade as a philosopher, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video now. So please, pray for the coming of the kingdom. Please learn more. Check out the books I, I, I mentioned. Uh, do your own research online. You don't need to read my books. My books are just my own unworthy introductions to this. I, I, this simply needs to get out. Ask God for his will. Jesus, I trust in you. Thy will be done. I give you my will. Please give me yours in return. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you. Pray for me. Be assured of my prayers for you.